thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. This is spring. How many of us are approaching midlife and hearing that we're no longer spring chickens anymore? How much longer can this crazy cliche go on about aging and the fact that we're just not as supple and vile as we used to be? Well, think about springtime also as a time of renewal and cleansing. That being true, then that means that we get to renew ourselves no matter what age we are every single spring. So that way we get to be perpetual spring chickens. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is our guest, Laura Sweeney, and we're going to be talking about the wonderful renewal and cleansing time of spring. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program, Laura Sweeney. And Laura, how are you doing out there this fine spring day? Oh, I am so happy that spring is finally here. (laughs) (laughs) That's for sure. Now, let's talk about spring and its essence. Now, a lot of people understand it's a season where we get to see the sun coming out a little bit more, maybe a little bit of rain here, but at least the cold weather is behind us. Well, yes, that's, of course, one of the most notable factors of spring, that the Days are getting longer, and with that, we come closer to the the sun, uh, us here in the Northern Hemisphere. The ground starts to warm up, and everything on the planet gets a burst of energy. That that warmth from the sun, boy, that, that is powerful stuff. And we see it in the land, we see it in the animals, and, of course, we see it in ourselves. Mm-hmm. little spring in our steps, so to speak. Now, you know, I was kind of curious about the term spring cleaning. Where did that come from exactly? Well, this is a really interesting uh, idea, the idea that with spring, as you said, there's renewal. And spring cleaning isn't just something our moms did or our grandmas. This is a really old tradition. It comes out of both Persia and the Celtic lands. Oh. where once um, once it was noticed that this time of renewal had come, there was the feeling that you have the ability to sweep out the old and bring in the new. There was a lot that had to do with cleansing, cleansing of the house. Um, I'm sure some of your older listeners will remember their their mother's and grandmothers and aunts taking the linens out and laying them out and um, pounding the mattresses and the carpets so that even the places where we lay, where we rested, were renewed. That was thought to help renew our dreams as well as our physical bodies. And there is a lot of evidence that, um, that there also the fire in the house the cooking fires were renewed at the same time that walls were painted or whitewashed, things were disinfected, all of the old cold illness things, things that you got from the cold were being ushered out and the healing powers of the warmth were being invited in both uh, practically through getting things clean but also spiritually and intentionally by uh, creating these ritual tasks. One of the things that I thought was really interesting when I started wondering about spring cleaning myself and did a little bit of reading on it was uh, the idea of the hearth fires that mm-hmm. people would use. And there's a tradition both in Chinese New Year and also in the Celtic traditions that uh, May 1st, for the Celts and and the traditional Chinese New Year, which is sometime in early February, a little bit earlier than what we call spring, were a time when the actual fire of the house was renewed. This spring and some of the rituals and festivals associated with spring are fire festivals to celebrate the return of the sun. And traditionally, say in China, you put out all the fires in the house You ate a cold meal that was the traditional meal, and then you relit the fires from a central bonfire that was a community fire. So not only did you reset your own house, but you reset it from the communal aspect of your very own own neighborhood. Uh, I 
I love that. I had never even heard of that, but I was surprised to discover that it's it's um, really quite pervasive. Also, in in the Celtic mythologies, um, spring because of its renewal nature and its tie to to the earth was supposed to be a real heavy fairy time. There were lots of fairy energies associated with spring. And one of the Celtic traditions is that each person who came and celebrated on, this was a May 1st tradition, a purification tradition. Each person who came and celebrated around the the community fire took a piece of that fire home and restarted their own personal hearth with it. They didn't ask for somebody to give them embers. They took them because it was a strong belief that the fairy folk uh, might show up in human guise and the fairy folk didn't have the ability to create fire themselves. That was one of the things that distinguished human beings from fairies. And so they couldn't take fire without asking. So nobody ever asked for embers. Everybody that was human (laughs) just Mm -hmm. took them and took them home. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff associated with something as simple as spring cleaning. You know, as as you were talking about in Asia, how they had their particular tradition of not having the fire and eating cold meals, I wonder if that's where the bologna sandwich came on the horizon. (laughs) 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 You know, but what you do bring up is something that you you see it in America, uh, and that is the, the celebrations, if you will, but it seems as though the celebrations at least maybe not everywhere but in in some cases have sort of lost that 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 energy that they used to have as far as the traditional celebrations go you take a look at something for instance like an oktoberfest for instance and now it's become nothing but a big german beer bust versus oh. what oktoberfest really is and when you take a look at uh, things such as spring and you think of easter and the spring equinox you look at easter for instance and how we do it, you know, it's a bunny that runs around hiding eggs and kids get chocolate and baskets. And you wonder, what were those original traditions, you know, such as Easter and the spring equinox, and how are they actually celebrated? Well, that's, that's a wonderful idea to start thinking about. I know that as I've allowed myself to do research into some of our more fundamental traditions, uh, I, having... Interest in gardening brought it up for me. Mm-hmm. And once I started getting interested in gardening, I started to think about how gardening ties me to the earth in some very fundamental ways. And I started to notice how I was untied from the earth in, in a lot of other ways. I was watching television. I was into con- consumer culture. I was, you know, living the American dream. Right. And as I started to do a little bit of research around, you know, like when I had kids and Easter. Easter is such a kid's holiday. What, what's Easter really all about? I started to do some reading about it and discovered, oh, my gosh, you know, there's all kinds of really interesting earth-based rituals associated with what I had just taken to be, uh, you know, a consumer orgy of buying chocolate eggs and <laughs> dyeing eggs and, you know, getting buying new clothes and, and all this consumer stuff. And so it's, it's very interesting to me how what you get out of a holiday is shaped by your own worldview. Mm-hmm. Now, I noticed that as I changed my worldview, what I wanted out of the holidays changed as well. Still the same holiday. Mm-hmm. And some of the reasons some of the reasons we do what we do make a whole lot more sense to me now than than they just seemed like empty exercises, like the buying new clothes bit. You know, everybody always had a new hat for Easter. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a, a tradition that I, I knew about. And again, it goes back to that idea of spring cleaning and throwing out the old and bringing in the new so that you're actually purifying yourself. I mean, who would have thunk? So when I kind of got this real interesting cycle of, you know, going out of my consumer culture mindset and thinking, oh, no, that's all, you know, that's all crap that's been fed to me. And all of this nature stuff is is where it's at. And then as I start to explore that, I come to understand 
that the traditions are all the same. We just do them for different reasons, mm-hmm. which was really fun to discuss. <laughs> mm. So Easter, as you looked into it, was actually what? Well, Easter um, is a is a festival that's celebrated ugh, almost universally. The the um, the equinox, which is when day and night are the same length. That is official. That is officially the start of of spring, um, when the days actually start to lengthen. And um, in pagan traditions, it was associated with fertility because people were coming to understand that that the fertile cycle of the earth was back on target. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with the idea of the Easter bunny and eggs. And uh, every kid has said to their mom at one time or another, what do rabbits and eggs have to do with each other? How did this happen? You know, Mm -hmm. rabbits don't have eggs. And the idea of rabbits are that they're very fertile creatures. And when the, the, the sun warms up the land and the grass starts to grow again, the rabbits start procreating. And they happen to be the bottom level of the food chain for a lot of other animals. They feed the raptors. They feed the, the higher level um, carnivores. And so the idea of rabbits producing more and more of themselves was a sign that food was on the upswing, that we made it out well, of I don't know. There could be a correction on that, Laura, when you say that they're at the bottom of the food chain, because I don't remember ever Elmer Fudd being fed by a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Just oh, thought I'd bring that, that in there. <clears throat> I think he that needed some American spring cleaning. That's <laughs> underdog mentality, you know? <laughs> and a rabbit, I guess, in this case. <laughs> so how but, they merge both the egg and the rabbit together is I guess a, a, an interesting question, or, or you know, how did that happen? Yeah, well, the egg is a, a very powerful symbol of a couple of different things. One, it's round, and it invites us to remember the circle or the wheel of the year. Things that are round are found. Oh my gosh, cross culturally, there's a lot of Native uh, American and South American traditions and Inuit in the North traditions, that um, things that are round, and particularly eggs, have the power of the universe within them. They are the ultimate example or or symbol of creation because they have that round shape, no beginning and no end, things that go on and on, and within them there is life. There is the genesis of life. So... um, in, to go back to the Chinese system, their idea of, well, and then, East, and then East Indian, the idea of karma, that things come back over and over and over again. Well, they were big. They had, they had egg hunts as well, oddly enough. They would roll eggs down the hill, and then they would go out and find them. The idea of your karma flowing away from you and then you had to go look for it it flowed where it wanted to go and it was your job to take the journey and to find where your karma lay oh that's interesting isn't that interesting yeah yeah and i i I mean who would have thunk easter egg hunts you know here in the united states were instituted by abraham lincoln in um uh 1862 I, i i love this little fact yeah, we were in the middle of the Civil War. It was a really big depression in the United States because all of our money was going to munitions. So he decided to do something fun, and he had the first White House egg roll. <laughs> and, and I thought, once again, oh, some commercial thing. But to discover that it has these deep roots in all these other cultures was just, oh, it was just delightful to me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's certainly a different spin on Easter than what we traditionally hear. As you said, it's the new hat or it's the Easter dress. It's going to church. It's allegedly celebrating the, the arisen Jesus. As I, I mean, there are a lot of ways that we look at it. And then you bring up the, you know, the thing about the egg, and I think, oh, that's kind of that's really really interesting to to find out a different way, as you said, to understanding these things, and then the way that you begin to see life in and of itself. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, I, 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 if I want to be negative, I can say, oh my gosh, all these traditions have co-opted some fundamental beliefs. And when I choose to be positive, then I can say, you know what, these are universal truths. And whether they're cloaked in the idea of uh, the rebirth and resurrection of Christ, um, or whether they're cloaked in um, eggs being karmic representations. I, you know, the idea that I'm thinking about it is what becomes mo- most important to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes the most sense as well, too. Now, during the spring, what about food? I th- as you were talking about, you know, it's the dousing of the fire more or less in Asia, so they go to eating cooler foods. Is that significant when it comes to spring? Well, yes. There are a number of different types of thoughts about particular kinds of food when it comes to springtime. There are ritual foods, which become very important during celebration times, things like milk. Milk is a big symbol for spring because it, it indicates that, that animals are lactating, that they're giving birth successfully, and so sheep's milk, and cow's milk, and goat milk. You see a lot of that, and desserts, sweet, special-time foods made with milk are are very obvious in in time. You also see honey in a lot of the foods because bees um, are able to go out and start foraging. The bees make honey. Honey is their own food source. That's what honey is. And they go out, and they, as the blossoms start to come on, they, they're going out and they're foraging. So the honey starts to flow again. There starts to be enough to be able to take some for us and leave some for the bees. So uh, human beings having that innate sweet tooth, we go, well, traditionally, we had gone for a long time in the winter really being careful about only having sweet very, very seldom and little tiny bits to make sure you got through till till spring. Mm-hmm. And now here it is spring. And so everybody has honey on all their their cakes and their they make honey wine or mead, which is um, something that you have to brew, you have to actually ferment and it doesn't actually come to come into its drinkableness until fall. Um, there's some interesting correlations between spring and fall that I, I was delighted to discover. But so as far as foods, you've got milk and you've got honey and, of course, the land of milk and honey. I mean, we have all heard that, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a deeply ingrained understanding. Mm-hmm. And and then there's the foods that are associated with what's actu- what the earth actually brings us out of the ground not just from our animal friends, but from the ground itself. And here we start moving into the idea of spring tonics. There are, well, in, when you start looking at the healing traditions of, of cultures, their native wisdom, we go into the kind of thing that you were talking about in your introduction, where spring is viewed as a time of, of renewal, where you get to be out of the house a little bit more, where you're starting to see things spring up all over the place. And one of the the great traditions as a a spring tonic, something that tonifies your system, that exercises it a little bit and supports it at the same time, would be nettles. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who have had run-ins with nettles as a kid at camp and such, (laughs) I know it's hard to imagine that nettles have an attractive side to them, but they do. They're one of the highest sources of protein and chlorophyll and iron in, in the green world. And they're also, oddly enough, one of the first things that come out of the ground in the spring. So there's a great tradition among healers to go through and harvest those greens, of course, with something to protect your hands with because you don't need to be stung by them. That's not of part not. of the ritual. And gather them up and boil them or eat them as you would spinach. Oh, my gosh, to make the most succulent spinach-type thing you can imagine. And they lose their sting when you cook them. Mm -hmm. So they're just fantastic to have as a side dish, um, as a soup base. If you boil them, they make just a wonderful soup base. kind of tastes like asparagus. 
and they leave your broth just full of all of these incredible um, phytonutrients, little micro um, nutrients that we all need. Get, get your iron going, get your kidneys going, get your liver going. Helps you to, you know, regain that spring chicken thing you're talking about. Right. And not only, this is really interesting too, not only are nettles good for humans, but traditionally farmers have used nettle tea to fertilize their young plants. Uh-oh. So they would pick a bunch of nettles and they would soak them in a big old barrel of water until the water actually started to bubble, you know, we're talking like a week, and it started to kind of smell funny. And what was happening was it was anaerobic decomposition. It was actually starting to rot in the water. But that that process of decomposition was pulling apart the nutrients that are in the nettles so that then you could take the water that was now full of all the nutrients and you could water your plants with it. So the plants also were then receiving all of the micronutrients and the iron and it was giving their system a workout, and it was making them stronger and more nutritious for the farmers. So yeah. nettles, are, they're a big one. Well, I was actually going to say, <clears throat> in support of what you're saying, is I believe it was last week we had uh, produced a segment where we were talking with a lady who is very well versed when it comes to herbs and the uses of herbs, and she said she had given like the top three or four that people should make, uh, as you were saying, uh, tonics. I, I don't know that that was the word she, but let's just say tonics. And um, and uh, basically what you did, nettle was like number one, you oh, know, on yeah. her list. And she says what you do is you take an ounce of, of stinging nettle dry, and you go ahead and you boil some water, and then you pour it into a quart jar and then you put the nettles into that, and then you go ahead and you close it, and you let it steep for about four or five hours. She says what she usually does is that she'll actually uh, put it in the quart jar, you know, with the boiling water, seal it, and then just, you know, and, and do it overnight, you know. Mm-hmm. And then that way, and then in the morning, you just go ahead and you just drink that quart. And she says your energy will just go through the roof, you know, oh, in a yeah. very natural way. And then there were a lot of other things. And then she talked about things such as red clover. But there were these, as she called them, the top four that you should have for these herbal infusions, if you will. And mm-hmm. and here you are, you're literally saying, yeah, that's exactly, when you go out there in the spring and you find that sting and nettle, collect as much of it as you can because I can tell you this. Here's a plant that's probably readily available just about anywhere if you know where to go look for free, and they're charging about a dollar fifty an ounce. Oh yeah, <laughs> when oh, you yeah. go to a health food store. So just think yeah. about that for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you have access to uh, a place that you know doesn't have any uh, pollution in it, mm-hmm. and you happen to know that there's stinging nettle there, you can harvest nettle up to the point where it gets those little tassels. Those little they look like um, tassels of of beads. Those are the seeds of the nettle, okay. and I'm all about low-tech harvesting. <laughs> so you get your gloves, you go out, and you cut the plant until you see those seed heads. And by that time, the plant is using all of its good stuff. So it really doesn't have a whole lot more. It, it, it's not as full of it as it was in the spring. But mm-hmm. if you have a, something as simple as a hot car, okay, a car that's sitting on a hot driveway, you take your nettle plants, you put them out on some foil or, uh, you know, if you've got a screen, that's great. But if you don't, then don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Set it on a nice, clean T-shirt and leave it in the car to dry. And once it dries till it's crispy to the touch, then you can take it and you can um, take the leaves off and put them in some baggies or some mason jars or something like that because you will, have, you will still have that, the, the freshness and those, those amazing micronutrients that we, we miss all winter long. Right. Because what we're eating in the winter is food that's, that's got a lot of starch in it because it stores well. Mm-hmm. And, um, but we don't have those fresh bursting nutrients that are the, the signs of things just starting to grow and growing with fantastic gusto. So, yeah, not only can you make nettle infusions, but every time you make soup, Take some of those little flakes and throw them into your soup, whether it's a canned 
you know, you're making some progresso minestrone or whatever. Just grab a little handful of those nettle flakes and throw that in there. Mm-hmm. And and then for those of us who suffer from uh, spring allergies, <laughs> mm-hmm. this is this is where going to the health food store is is actually worth it. For you. Another thing that's really cool about nettles is it acts as a prophylactic, a protective agent against hay fever. Oh. I don't. I don't even know that we know how this works yet, but we know that it does. So for people who use the Claritin and all of those, those technical um, allergy aids, um, I've known several people who have started to take dried nettle in capsule form, and they just take it every day. And it builds up to a point where they notice that their systems, their, their systems are working beautifully, and if they get symptoms at all, they're so mild that they don't have to resort to pharmaceuticals that that can be really overpowering to your system. You know, and that was the other thing that, excuse me, that she brought up too, is that when you do these herbal infusions, you know, and again, you're talking quite a bit about nettle here, is that I think how it helps the, the allergies and the hay fever, if you will, is because if I remember right, she says it begins to reduce inflammation. Mm-hmm. That's what causes you to be itchy and sneezy and nasty, you know, because your body's just so, you know, infuriated, you know, and you need something. <laughs> That's what this does, is it just kind of calms all that down. <clears throat> so it's amazing, That's you know. A, yeah. And I would think that you would pick a nettle that has its seeds. That way you could bring it home and you can go ahead and just grow them right in your backyard where you know it's not going to probably be well, polluted. Yeah, you can certainly do that. Now, nettle is a very forceful plant. And uh, when she gets going, she really will go. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to have a nettle patch where they know the ground is is pure, that's a little shady, that's moist, and so you don't have to water it too much, and that is easily corralled. So you don't want to put your nettle patch right next to your back door or something like that because, (laughs) you you know, you two will fight. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure of that. And and trust me, us humans will lose yeah. because Nettle is, you know, she's sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I respect her power, and I um, make sure that when I start a Nettle patch, it's in a place where she can have her space and I can have mine, mm-hmm. and we can we can all work together peacefully. Now, Laura, we have just a, a little bit of time left, say about two to three minutes now. Let's talk about traditions associated with May 1st. Oh, May 1st is... Well, May first is a biggie. That is, um, that is well in in our American culture, we know May first as May Day, and a lot of our traditions that are associated with May Day are from Germanic culture, Teutonic culture. The Maypole is a an obvious phallic symbol, and mm. in German Teutonic culture, May first is all about fertility. It's about celebrating fertility. It's about um, boys and girls dancing together. It's about partnership. A lot of people choose May 1st to get married or to, uh, to do a hand fasting, which would be you know, the pagan version of marriage. And oddly enough, for most Celtic pagans, um, May 1st is about, um, it's not about fertility, but it's about protection. Mm-hmm. All this incredible power that's coursing through the earth, they were really cognizant that that was strong and they needed protection. So once again, you have the idea of fire coming into play. You may have heard of, uh, of May Day fires, May Day bonfires, mm-hmm. and that, that's a tradition having to do with the protection of the fire. They used to, um, the Celts used to build two fires and have their animals run through in between the two fires because fire was thought to be a protective force. Of course, we talked about the starting of your household with a new fire. And, uh, but me personally, I really like the, the fertility rituals <laughs> that are associated with May Day um, because, you know, they're fun, they're whimsical, they're, they're examples if you take the, the wheel of the year and say spring is the, is the, the new part, it's, it symbolizes 
new love. It, it symbolizes the 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 joy of that, all of that powerful energy. And wow, you want to talk about feeling like a spring chicken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's just nothing like love and passion to get you going that way. And to have an entire day that is, it's like Valentine's Day all over again, right? Except mm-hmm. everything, Valentine's Day for the, I mean, for outside, it's pretty quiet. It's not real reminiscent of that, but boy, you get to May 1st and you have, things busting out all over the place. And um, so that's a really strong tradition for for May 1st. It's power. And, I mean, you can even see that in something as esoteric as May 1st being International Workers Day Mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. You know, May Day um, for them was a, a very powerful symbol of worker solidarity. So whether you choose to view it as, as uh, a time for uh, looking for protection, whether you view it as a time for uh, marshalling your passion or just celebrating power in all of its forms, well, you can't hardly find a more auspicious day than May 1st. I'll tell you, it's always interesting to have guests on the program when we talk about uh, things such as seasons, and most of us just kind of take it for granted, oh, here's spring, here's summer, here's fall, here's the winter, and maybe some activities that you do around that. But to think of the essence of what they actually mean to us in all cultures, it really becomes very fascinating. Well, and that's one of the things that I love about our conversation. It it gets me thinking about what do I know about this. And and as I've started to study study this kind of work, I am always delighted to come away with some new piece of information that I didn't know that makes my experience every year that much richer, that much more profound. In each season, when I choose to be intentional about how I move through my life, I choose to learn about what happens outside of myself, what's happened in the past, and how that's informed what happens now. I find myself comforted by having a place in history. I find I don't need to watch TV to entertain myself. I don't need to go out and buy things to entertain myself. I can read. I can garden. I can cook. I can celebrate. All of these things, you know, they're free. They're simple. They're, they connect me with my family and my friends and my history. Mm-hmm. And my my life is just so much richer for it. And I, and I hope I can encourage your listeners to to uh, try that that kind of exploration for themselves and you could always discover that although you may be watching tv and following our financial economic world crisis that the world is actually a lot kinder more playful and more abundant than you can ever imagine if you're just willing to step into it laura oh, sweeney yeah. thank you so much for joining us here on the program today oh thank you daniel it's always a pleasure you bet. Is there any way that if people wanted to contact you to find out more about what it is that you do and as you describe uh, things such as uh, the seasons, that they can find out more about that? Well, you know, what I would do is um, I'm part of a group that has a festival every year. It's coming up in the end of June. It's called the Fairy Congress. And you can go to www.fairycongress.org, and that's F-A-I-R-Y, Fairy Congress. And there you'll see a group of people who are celebrating these kinds of nature traditions, who are celebrating the idea of nature spirits cross-culturally, whether they're Chinese, whether they're Persian, whether they're South American, whether they're Celtic. And if you start hanging with people like that and you start reading a little bit about what they have to offer, it, it broadens, it's broadened my life. And so I encourage your listeners to, to look up fairycongress.org and see what you find there. Very good. Well, Laura Sweeney, again, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to learn so much deeper about what seasons are and how they're celebrated and honored around the world that makes you actually, again, be in the world and not of it. And it's been a pleasure to have you on the program again. Thank you, Daniel. I know you've got the spring in your step now. (laughs) I'm still a spring chicken. I don't care what age we are. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you again, Laura. Thank you.
So there it is. Be in the world and not of it. Find just wonderful ways that you can get involved and just really see and enjoy what's all around you. You'll find that just as in the Wizard of Oz, as the Witch of the East simply said, you had it inside of you all the time. That's what spring can certainly bring out of you. Again, thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I want to thank all of you listeners for tuning in. We do welcome your questions or comments. Just simply shoot us an email, daniel at beyond50radio.com. Also want to thank the following sponsor for making this program possible, ZRT Laboratory. So if you're suffering from hot flashes, foggy thinking, sudden weight gain, low libido, mood swings, and other effects of aging, ZRT Laboratory, the forerunner in hormone testing, is your first step toward ending troublesome symptoms. Visit them online at www.zrtlab.com to find out how their home collection kits can help detect and correct hidden hormone imbalances. Let testing be your guide to symptom relief and life-changing solutions that begin with you. Also be sure that you have physician's guidance. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Remember, live your day past halfway.